and welcome to Ravenheart Renditions. And today I have the opportunity to talk with Mr. Ron Hawk. How you doing, Ron? Good. How are you doing, Andrew? Doing great. Actually, uh, freezing. It's, it's getting stupid cold here right now. <laughs> well, it's cold here too, but this is California, so I have a feeling it's a real different standard. Yeah, um, I think, the, what was it, and this coming up Monday, the high is going to be two. <laughs> okay, I, I won't, I won't, I won't. I will neither tell you about our hide, nor will I complain about it anymore. Well, that's okay. One of the guys that worked for me, uh, he, he's going to Florida, and he was rubbing in that the, <laughs> the low was 70-something, and I told yeah, him. Yeah, chilly. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had to put on a windbreaker. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had a chance to, to harass you a little bit at, work, at Woodworking in America this year, and uh, I'm, glad I, I'm glad I did. And uh, I wanted to have some time to talk to you. And first off, I wanted to ask, so you're known for – um, anybody I know that's going to replace a blade on a, a, a plane blade, uh, it's on a Stanley plane or a wood body or anything, they look at Ron Hawk blades um, or Hawk, Hawk tools and, and say, we're putting a Hawk blade in this thing. Um, you get planes from uh, Scott Meek. They come with your blades in them. And so what got it? So you, we know you're known for it, but how did you start end up, I'm going to make plane blades? <laughs> um, well, I'm not sure how long you want this answer to last, but uh, it all started 32 years ago, I think now. Mm-hmm. Um, I was uh, uh, we we moved to Fort Bragg. It's a long story about the family business, and and I, we my father and I uh, sold the family business, and I ended up here in Fort Bragg, and he had moved out to the desert, and we we managed because of that to maintain our friendship, which was good because it was dicey there for a while. <laughs> um, so so here I was trying to figure out what to do, and I decided I wanted to be a, a knife maker. And, you know, this was uh, 81. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got saw blades from the lumber mill here in town, and I torched them out, and I ground them out, and I made knives out of them and, and went to the craft fairs. Marketing was a, a difficult uh, job back then because it was all craft fairs and direct mail. There was no Internet. Mm-hmm. So um, – the and we we moved here by sheer coincidence the same month that Jim Krenov opened the shop his school here at the College of the Redwoods, oh. and I mean I I don't even remember if I knew who he was at that time. My entire <laughs> woodworking experience was uh, you know a high school shop, mm-hmm. so uh, so that was a big deal in this town because he was a big deal and he brought something really cool here. Sure and. Eventually, later on in that, that first school year, uh, one of the instructors and one of the students showed up and said, we hear you're making knives. Can you make blades for us? And I, I, I essentially tried to chase them away. I said, you know, I'm busy going broke making knives. <laughs> and and they, they talked me into it. Basically, you know, the, the word came down that there's 22 students. They each make six or eight planes every year. You know, do the math, dummy. And so I decided to try it out. We made one batch that was simply the wrong alloy, and it's a long story, and I you, you needn't be bothered by that. <laughs> but the second batch was the correct alloy, which was even an even easier alloy to obtain. It's good old O1 that everyone knows by now. Mm-hmm. And that batch was very popular, and I I, you know, I became this uh, um, minor celebrity in a very you know in a very small pond here at the College of the Redwoods. I'd show up with blades, and they'd buy them all because they had no source for decent blades at all at that time. Mm. So well, it's a good place so, to be a minor celebrity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it worked out. I simply fell into something. I was uh, I was open to it, but ignorant of it, and had to learn everything about it. I had to build a plane to find out how, why why they cared about them being a certain way. Mm. All of that kind of thing. So uh, it was a uh, for me, it was not a horrible learning curve. It was you know it was still the same metallurgy and the same stuff. And uh, I, I I'm a, I'm good at making stuff, so I figured out how to do all of that. And uh, the the reason um, that I, I think the, the, the reason that I, the Hawk brand became sort of a standard for a replacement blade is simply because I just got here first. There was very little going on in woodworking, at least apparently at that time, <laughs> because without an Internet to talk about it, uh, you know, we, they were fine woodworking magazine was just a year or two old, and it was a you know, black and white uh, magazine yep. that was uh, the only national magazine at that time. Um, now there's what six or eight of them that are you know full color glossy. Oh yeah. You know, wood, woodworking has become a huge industry. Mm-hmm. And I was I, and so you know basically I was just here first. I I I established a standard for a better blade that everyone else has had to kind of catch up. Now I've got quite a bit of competition, but I spent the first I don't know 15 years without anybody else competing with me. Well, that's a good good spot to no, be in. No, we're, we're <laughs> and when we're glad that you fell into what you did because we. I am. I am too. I can't <laughs> tell you how fortunate I am, and and 
not not only did it suit me just perfectly because I'm this was something that I could do and do really well. Uh, even with my very limited facility here, I was able to crank out really good blades. Mm -hmm. um, but I I found myself in a the woodworking world and. I can't tell you how happy I am to be associated with all of you guys because woodworkers turned out to be, you just, I don't know how to say it, remarkably decent people, high integrity, really fun to be around, smart, um, all, all the good things, you know, about, about that you would want in a, in a customer base. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just one I'm of just the totally, customers. Thank you. <laughs> I'm totally fortunate and I couldn't be more grateful. Well, good. Thank you. Yeah. I think, I think everybody Thanks. listening would like to hear that. <laughs> good. Um, well, there's there's things that you do um, you offer on your site other than just blades too, and and they're they're offered through more than just your site, obviously. But um, so what what kind of products do you all have out there? I I know of some of them, and I don't think I know all of them either. <laughs> um, well, I, I my whole product development strategy all along has been to wait for someone to ask me to make it, and when enough people ask me, I, d I add it to the catalog. <laughs> um, basically, I've been pulled along. I've never pushed very hard on this whole business. I've just waited for the... I've, I, I, I wanted to be sort of the, the metal worker for the woodworkers, so when woodworkers said, we, we need a better blade for this thing, or whatever it might be, I would go find out what that thing was and then see how many there might be out there try to get an idea of how big the market might be for that new scraper blade or plain block plane blade or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I would uh, figure out how to make it and test it out with the people that I know and trust and, and uh, add it to the catalog. So we have um, blades and, and then we added breakers in at some point because, again, enough people asked for them and I thought, oh, nobody needs a breaker. Every plane's got a breaker, but there was a demand for a better breaker and I, I'm surprised at how well they sell. Mm -hmm. So we added breakers. We have blades and breakers for bench blades. We have all the blood, the basic block plane blades, um, and the you know the one or two or three or four spoke shaves, and then the make it yourself spoke shave blades. Mm -hmm. And that led into kits to make a spoke shave with a blade and a stick of wood that's been machined easily. And uh, we have uh, kits that are uh, make a Krenov style blade, um, sim similar to what Scott's doing. But Scott's doing a really nice job, and he's coming along beautifully in his little business. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I like Scott a lot. Yep. <laughs> and and uh, um, what, what else? Uh, so there's and so there was a shoulder plane kit. Someone said we should do that, so we did. Uh, someone asked me for a, a scratch stock, and I had to ask them what that was because I've never <laughs> heard of it before. But suddenly the scratch stock was everywhere. There were articles about it and people talking about it, and mm -hmm. so we hit we hit that market just about the right time, and we sell scratch stocks like crazy. Uh, marking knives, uh, burnishing rods. Um, the violin knives, there was a violin maker down in L.A. Um, this was a long time ago. He has since died. His name was Hans Weishar. Hmm. And he was well-known and, and well-loved as, as an instructor. And, uh, and, and a, um, he had a shop uh, uh, with a number of craftsmen people doing a lot of repair work on violins and things. And one of his students came to me and said, we need uh, blades like these. And he actually sent me a set that he had had from, you know, Germany, the old country kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So his set of uh, four, um, just on the sizes, we ended up with three that satisfied that. And he was very happy oh, about cool. that thing. So, they, so that's how those things get added in. And that's, I guess, pretty much the catalog um, you know, in, in a very abbreviated form. Yeah. I wrote a book on sharpening that you know about. Yep, uh, perfect, perfect edge. I actually uh, had a chance to to see you speak about uh, sharpening at, at Woodworking Good. in America this year. Good. Um, which which was uh, fun and er, informational and entertaining at the same time. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> so, if for for someone who may not have have used one of your blades before, say I have an old Stanley plane and and I want to put a new uh, hawk blade in it. Yeah. What do I have to do? Well, mostly it'll drop in. Uh, it is, however, slightly thicker, but only slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think a thicker blade is better, and, and I'm here to tell you that thicker blades are not necessarily thicker, all other things being considered. Mm -hmm. um, but a little, they're a little bit thicker because it, uh, the extra thickness actually makes them easier to hand hone because the bevel is longer, so they sit more rigidly on a stone. Mm -hmm. So our blades are slightly thicker. Um, which means they will uh, they will automatically take up more of the mouth aperture in the in the plane, and they may they may make it too small, in which case you'll have to move the frog back slightly mm -hmm. to achieve the correct mouth size. Uh, the the screw that holds it down, the screw in the center of the frog that holds the blade assembly into the plane, that'll probably have to come out about a half a turn, 
and that should be all you really have to do to do a, just a straight swap out. Mm-hmm. But while you're at it, there's a lot of plane tuning, and uh, oh yeah, go on, we can go on for hours about that. But uh, it's best at that time to you know examine the mouth. Is it nice and clean and crisp? That mouth opening is holding the shave the shaving down while it's being sheared, so it's good to have that cleaned up mm-hmm. nice and straight since you're adjusting the mouth aperture anyway. Uh, it's a good chance to take a look at your plane and see if anything looks too, um, what's the word I want, out of spec. Yep. And, but that's really all you have to do is those, those two adjustments are the only two that are required to account for the additional thickness of the blade and or breaker. Okay. So if somebody has the unfortunate, um, I'd say less expensive version of some of them yeah. without the movable frog, um, opening the, the mouth on there isn't really even that hard if you, if if it's if it's one that doesn't have a movable frog for some reason, um, opening that mouth to accommodate that blade really isn't that bad in, anyway. I mean, it, it's it, a it, it, it cast iron files really easily. It's just a matter of being patient and going really slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, however, most of those planes, uh, the mouths are too wide anyway. So yes, the extra thickness of the blade may just be just right. Yeah, it may help out. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. That's not uncommon on uh, spoke shaves and things that don't have that adjustment. Um, a lot of those uh, Stanley, like the 151 spoke shades, have huge gaping mouths on them, and the, the new thicker blade will often uh, take up some of that. If it takes up a little too much, it's it's just right to file out just enough to get it just exactly where you want it. Oh, cool. That's uh, yeah. That's and it, it and it's a couple of mine. I think I had one of mine that I had to open up a little bit, but it, and and I have since gotten rid of it because I on on one of the planes. Oh, yeah, on one of my older. I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know if it was a Stanley for sure. I had to open it up just, there, just a little bit. So There is one of the older types that has a real narrow mouth that the factory put in it. And sometimes if you try to move the frog back enough, the heel of the bevel will bump into the sole of the plane. Mm-hmm. You have to think about what I just said to you know visualize that. <laughs> it, it's really rare. It's a two-phone-call-a-year finagle uh, on my part where someone says, hey, this blade doesn't fit. And I say, okay, you got one of those. And it's, it's that unusual. But uh, in that case, there you do have to do a little bit of filing. But it, it's quite uncommon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and like I said, I think I don't even want to say how many planes I have anymore. And, and over ha- over half of them have had the ba- blades replaced over the years, and uh, one of all of them I had to to open the yeah. mouth a little more. So yeah, cool. Well, yeah. and speaking of uh, the perfect edge book, um, like I said, I had a, I had a chance to uh, to see you speak this year. I spoke to you at a different woodworking in America about sharpening, and. Um, I guess if somebody was going to be, you know, after you use your blades for a while, they, they all, like all blades, they need to be touched up. So, yeah. one, let's plug the book a little bit. And then, uh, so they should go buy that to learn it all, right? Absolutely. <laughs> there we go. So I, I, I attempted to write an encyclopedic explanation of sharpening. So people often say, so which one, what, what should I do? And I say, well, I tried, I offered every possible way to get there from here. So, um, I, you know, I didn't say go buy this and use this and do that. Uh, you know, which sharpening method do you prefer? And my answer is always the one you have. Mm-hmm. Learn how to use it. Techniques more important than tools. Learn how to sharpen, and then the the sharpening abrasives, the actual materials, the tools, the gadgets, the gear, all of that gets easier once you actually understand what you're doing with the geometry of it, the the actual um, physical ergonomics of actually doing that abrading of steel. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the actual abrasive involved, uh, the, those decisions get a lot easier if you if you have a sense of what you're doing. Sure. So when when you sharpen your blades, just out of curiosity, do you do um, do you use a jig or do you do freehand mainly? Well, it depends on a couple of things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pardon me. No, no problem. Um, first of all, I am not a woodworker, and and if 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 you didn't know that, now you do. <laughs> It's a fact. I'm the metal worker, so yep. you know you be you be the woodworker. Let's keep it that way. Um, so I don't sharpen as much as people think that I do. Uh, but when I do, I usually sharpen freehand. Uh, depends on exactly what I'm sharpening. Mm-hmm. There are some things that I think require a jig uh, or a fixture of some kind to hold a specific angle, so that you can repeat whatever performance you're getting from whatever tool you're using. In other words. If you have some very specific type of grain that is uh, being difficult and you've come up with the right geometry, say you have put a little back bevel on the blade or you've just got it working perfectly, mm-hmm. you want to be able to repeat that. So that's when I, I would highly recommend a, a honing guide of some kind or, or you know, the Tormek or any of those other kinds of systems that allow you to have a very consistent and very repeatable bevel angle. 
Sure. However, for most routine resharpening, you know, the run of the mill during the day, stop sharpening, put it back in. Mm-hmm. I think uh, learning how to hand hone, I think, is one of those skills that you should, that you should have. Sure. I think if you're going to spend as much time as, as people spend practicing, um, you know, mortise and tenon and dovetail joints and whatever the all those the the skill toolkit that you have as a woodworker, sh- spending time practicing your sharpening is one of those skills you should have. I know it's not actually removing wood, so you might not call it woodworking, but it is <laughs> a fundamental woodworking skill that every woodworker, you, you can't do anything without without sharp tools. It, it, it all starts there. Yeah. So learn how to sharpen. Practice on practice on your, you know, the chrome vanadium blades that came with your 60s Stanley plane. Mm-hmm. And, and then... Uh, you know, get get the skill set down for that, and it all just gets easier and easier. It gets to where you don't think about it too much. Yeah. And so it, that's that's what I encourage people to do. And when I need to sharpen something, um, because I, I I don't have a wood shop, I don't have a sharpening station, uh, I don't have a place to make that mess and to soak the stones and do all that. If I did, I would probably be a water stone user. Mm-hmm. But because I because I don't do that often, uh, I just pull out the glass plates with the with the sandpaper. The same thing you saw me demonstrate my yep. very brief demonstration on the WIA. So those are my – I brought my actual sharpening gear. <laughs> well, that's cool. <laughs> that was just two plates, four grips, and off I go. And for me, they last for months and months and months because, like I say, I, I just don't really need to do that much sharpening. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the for, for guys like me that aren't – maybe not doing it that often or something, they, you know, that, that's enough to get by. Then if it works, it is the right system. Then that's and and that's the part I like the best is you know if if, if you're an oil stone person then use oil stones if you're water that's stone right. use water stone whatever Absolutely. works to get the thing sharp <laughs> learn, learn how to use them mm-hmm. and and eventually when, once you get your technique down you'll say you know this grit this stone at this grit doesn't work right or it's not cutting fast enough or there's I don't like it it's too small or it's too something mm-hmm. then you go replace that or or you just decide at some point I'm sick of the oil mess or I'm sick of the water mess and I'm just going to go change to something else. Sure. There's a lot of options out there, um, but I think that you won't make the best decision on the options unless you know what you're doing as a sharpening guy. Yeah, cool. Well, of the products that you have out there, um, you're, you have you know several plane kits, several blades. You obviously have the, the Perfect Edge book that, that's somewhat new. You also have something that's a little different out on your site right now, the, the, the kitchen knife blanks. Yeah, we do. Um, I I started out as a knife maker, so it, this felt really good to kind of come back to this. And mm-hmm. the factory that we've been using, the, the factory in France that's been making our blades, um, excuse me, making the bulk of our blades for us now for uh, 15 years, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, they used to be a knife company, and and uh, for it's, it's a long story, but <laughs> they quit they quit making knives. They they preferred to make industrial cutters, which is how we found them. Uh, they're a great company. They're they're delightful people, and they're really good at what they do. And so I asked them if, uh, about making knife blades again, and then I thought, how oh, about if we make them for the kit? I've got a, a fairly ready market in the woodworking uh, guy, all of you guys, the woodworkers, that I think would be interested in having a kitchen knife made out of the same steel that we make our our high carbon blades out of. Um, and so they we worked, worked together and came up with designs and uh, talked back and forth about the, the shapes and the this and that. And they came up with a really beautiful product that I'm very proud of, and they're selling really well, and I think it's pretty exciting. So uh, w- once again, after 30 years, I'm a knife maker again. <laughs> That's, it comes full circle sometimes. <laughs> well, we're selling, we're selling this kit. I need to make that clear. They're not finished knives. You have to put the uh, handles on, which is what I have to or get to, I think, might be the better expression because it's really a fun project. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, to do that, they come with three steel pins instead of rivets and things like that. So you just epoxy it all together and then grind the pins down and shape the handles to fit. And a, a belt sander is a real ha- – I'm sorry, I know that's almost sacrilegious in the hand tool world. <laughs> but a belt sander is a really handy tool. So if you've ever needed an excuse to get a belt sander or borrow one from somebody, this, this will make the project well, go a lot better. Uh, us woodworkers always need an excuse to buy another tool. <laughs> yeah, I know. But the, you know, belt, belt sander doesn't have a great reputation amongst the hand tool uh, woodworkers. Well, you still got to do some stuff with it. It's okay. I've I've got a lot of power and a lot of hand tools here, both. So it's all good. <laughs> well, and that yeah, and that's what Mark wrote his book about recently. Spagnuolo wrote uh, the the hybrid woodworker. Yep. And, and, uh, I th- I think it's a, a a subject and a and he wrote a great book and I think it's a good a good idea 
uh, the balance shop idea and all of that sort of thing. So yep. yeah, I, I I agree. I'm not a I'm not a hand tool purist. <laughs> my my rule is if it's going to make me sweat, I'm going to flip flip a switch. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's a there hobby. I'm not overexerting here. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Some some people find the 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 sweat part part of the hobby. So I mean, I get yep. I under, I understand both sides of that perfectly yeah. well. And and to each his own. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I guess. Um, and one thing I do, I, I know you have a, a newsletter um, that that uh, email form that comes out uh, once a month, and and, yes. and there's a few other things. Are there? And there's there's the sharpening blog that you have there, and I and I'll post a, um, links to your site and a few other things yes. on here. Is there anything else you want to make sure they know about before uh, before I let you? Let you go about the the rest of your day. <laughs> no, the uh, the the email newsletter is approximately once a month. We're not very uh, religious about that, um, so it shows up kind of whenever. Lin- Linda actually is in charge. My wife Linda is in charge of uh, doing that. Sure. Um, and uh, so and she and we we try to make it informational without. It's not a big hype. It's not gee, this is on sale, go buy it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we try to. She tries to write articles that uh, and or do interviews with woodworkers, and it, they tend to somehow have sort of that. Um, uh, what, what, what's the word I want there? It'll be about a woodworker who's doing really great, interesting stuff, and they happen to use our blade. Oh, cool! So, so it sort of, uh, you know, it ties in, mm-hmm. even though it's uh, not really an overt marketing effort. Um, <laughs> it's more just about encouraging people to to get out there and, and do this stuff. And then I write uh, a variety of stuff on the blog. It's called a sharpening blog, but uh, I write about a lot of other stuff. Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't posted in a while. I need to get back into that. Well, and I've I've been I've been reading your blog and and I do get your your uh, email newsletters and they they are they are informative. It's not the you know the the normal email blast from from every company out there that says come buy my stuff. It actually is something to it. It's and and I, I'm happy to mention it. <laughs> Good. Well, we do try, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I um. I'm happy we got a chance to, to talk. And, uh, Me too, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you have a good night. Thank you very much. You too. And thanks. Take care. Thank mm-hmm. you.